Hello there, people and listeners of The Hungry Podcast. I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome Tommy Banks onto the podcast. Uh, Tommy is a prodigious chef and forager and entrepreneur, uh, the youngest chef in the UK to win a Manchester star at just 24. He's the owner of the Black Swan, Black Swan in Oldstead, where I ate on Saturday night. Absolutely insane meal. Thank you so much. Uh, Roots in York, which is also a Michelin star. He told Tommy won Great British Menu in 2016 uh, and 2017. He's recently launched a podcast called Seasons, which is a really interesting les- uh, listen and adds a lot of brand, um, lots of depth and richness to, to his restaurant. So I highly implore you to kind of check that out. He's also launched a premium wine in a can brand called Banks Brothers. Super, super busy man, Tommy. So thanks so much yeah. for uh, having me today. I really appreciate it. No, it's, it's nice of you to come to us as well. It's nice. I've not really had to do much. You've, you've come here and uh, you're here in beautiful North Yorkshire and I've just, just come along for a chat. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I wanted to, I so wanted to try the restaurant. And on Saturday, we're, we're in your gorgeous restaurant now. I just think it hit sort of the culmination of both art and magic it was like like everything about it i think in a restaurant is is there to sort of i don't know take you to a place that Mm. away from reality almost is what i think a great restaurant is and then obviously where we're sat here we've got the yorkshire moors or dales yeah with the moors here oh moors so it's like this whole idyllic view the sun was coming down there's like lambs dancing around so yeah no it was absolute pleasure coming (laughs) Uh, it's so cool you say that that's um that is something we talk about a lot, actually, is that I think when you go out for a special meal, it needs to be an escape from reality. And you have to sort of make sure that those things, uh, we were literally having a meeting about this last week, it's sort of making sure those things that are part of people's reality aren't there in this reality. So it's a case of like, you know, you don't see laptops out on the side or phones or people doing things like staff wise. It feels like people are just there to to, to serve you mm. and cook for you mm. and and you don't see any of the things that you see day to day because it needs to feel like a, an escapism for sure well when we walked in here because I didn't know what I was walking into right in a good way but the uh, sort of put that on airplane mode walked in and there was like the, the roaring fire the smell I don't know what it was I, was like, I don't know if it was like a vanilla smell or something like that. Oh, I probably got so raw with my palate mate so apologies yeah there was like a, a as a smell, and it's almost, almost sat down here before you go up to the restaurant, it creates mm. an element of suspense, great storytelling. And then obviously you go up and it's, we'll, we'll get all into this in a sec, but I, I loved it how the chairs were just slightly tilted at an angle. Mm. And, it, and it is, it was that escape from, from reality. I really think that's an interesting. Yeah, point. I think also our geography um, plays into our, our hands a bit. And I think in order to, I mean, you've obviously made a long journey to get here. In order to get here, everyone's got to make a journey because we're in the middle of nowhere. And and as you make that journey, whether you come by train or plane or car or whatever, as you get closer, you're going through all the rolling hills and it's past the sheep and past most of the things that we forage and all the sort of areas that are, form the sort of identity of our food. And I think when you by the time you get here, well, you're hungry for a start because mm-hmm. like you, yeah, yeah. you've been a long journey, but you've kind of like bought in and you've the journey sort of leads here. Um so I think people are already quite prepared for that. And then in terms of the restaurant itself, it's not a grand place. This is a 400-year-old Drover's pub. That, um, Dro- really, sorry, what's a Drover? Sorry, a Drover's. So they, well, you see this little lane here that runs down. That little lane was the Drover's Road from Edinburgh to York right. and then down to London. So people would historically have driven their cattle down mm. and this would be one of the places they'd stay. So they'd drive their cattle down to market uh, they drive them down. They'd stay here overnight. You know, just pop in. You get. I don't know what the fodder would have been, but you might do some sort of like bread and broth or something, and and you get your head down for the night, and your cattle would be tethered up in the back, and then you carry on your journey. Yeah. And that was literally sort of four hundred years ago. What this would have been, and then over the years has been funny little add-ons and bits in different decades. Um, so when you come in, what I like about it is it's probably fairly as it would have been all them years ago obviously there's a stone floor and stuff which is original so i, I kind of like that there's sort of this history to it it's very sort of humble but then upstairs the magic happens yeah and but it's not it's not obtuse it's not stuffy is what i think and it's it was super just relaxed and i want to get into this escape from reality art magic but where i want to start actually is is cricket 
Yeah. Uh, okay. You know, so I, I, I'm quite scatty with my approach to yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Just hopefully roll with it. Yeah, yeah, I talk about cricket all day. So, so I think sport and cookery have a lot of similarities. So that you obviously Gordon Ramsay was a footballer, mm. well, footballer at Rangers. Uh, I think Marcus Waring was a boxer. And I think there is, is, I love exploring these parallels. So I'd love to know is how did, what lessons did you take from being a formidable cricketer that helped you become, you know, one of the youngest chefs with a Michelin star? Um, I mean, I, I think sport, and not just in, in cooking, but in all sort of work and business, mm. sport, there's so many parallels. And I just think it's great if kids are playing sport growing up because you're learning so many life skills. I think that the big thing for me was, uh, especially in cricket, where it's probably a little bit less age group specific, I would have been, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old playing in men's cricket teams on a weekend, which would have you playing with guys in their 20s and 30s. And the things that you learn at a very young age about life, I think stands you in a really good stead. Um, but but I think the probably the biggest thing would be man management. And I think cricket out of all, I mean, like you can be the captain in a football team mm. and basically you're just the talisman. You try and just sort of drag everyone along with you. Um, but in cricket, it's a proper tactical thinking game and you've got to get the best out of people. And I think growing up, I was always like the captain of the cricket teams and you'd have to get the best out of people and and get everybody. It's a long game, so you've got to keep people like, get the best out of them. And I think that, so it's still being good to say come to the kitchen because again it's that my management you it's long days in the kitchen you got to get the best out of people and make them feel comfortable and express themselves and i think it was that sort of man management more than anything and of course the competitive side as well yeah for sure and i think man management's really interesting and what you what you said about parallel sport is a great parallel to business mm -hmm. and cookery the 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 guy the James Dyson the guy did the well, yeah. I'll say Hoover right? but he's, yeah. he basically said in the school you learn more doing sport than you do than you do in any mm -hmm. fucking classroom <laughs> yeah yeah oh a hundred percent you do and also what I love about sport is you get out what you put in mm -hmm. there is no shortcuts is there you can't um, there is no shortcuts in sport you can't like train half assed and and then still win <laughs> it doesn't work like that like people can be naturally talented but you have to make the most of that talent. And I feel like that's exactly the same in, in the kitchen. I wouldn't, I don't really believe in this sort of uh, natural talent when it comes to cooking. I actually think it comes to working hard, uh, application. Yeah, you can be creative. Of course you can. But, and, you, and you have to maybe have like a scientific understanding of like the processes that you're doing. But really the most of it is it's a craft and it's a skill and it's a repetitive thing. And it's about what you put in mm -hmm. um, and having that sort of dedication. I think that's a, a great parallel as well because you can't be successful in cooking if you if you're not taking it seriously. Well, the, the, um, David Ogilvy, who's the big advertising guy, I'm just I was reading his book. He, he took he said he took all his lessons in business from when he was working in a, in a kitchen in Paris. Right, and then this guy's like he's passed away years ago now, but he's a big advertising guy. And yeah, I think you're right exploring exploring the parallels. And what you said there is man management and getting. The best out of people. So lots of people listening to this podcast uh, are basically be leading and, and building teams in food. How how do you get the best out of your team when they come to work? Like what are some sort of specific things you do? So it's all about creating the right environment. Uh, I know that sounds really obvious, yeah. uh, almost a cliche, but I think the the point there is that I think egos are the biggest evil in any in any environment whether that's sport, whether that's cooking, any business. If you have somebody, especially at the top, who has an ego, they try and be God in their own little world. And they're usually blokes, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it just, you're not doing it for the right reasons. What you, Everything that we do should be aimed towards creating the best product. But as soon as somebody has an ego in the mix, it's not about creating the best products anymore, is it? Um, it's actually about fulfilling their insecurities. And that's the thing that we've always tried to do. I'm sort of the the boss, I suppose, but I don't have ego. I don't bring any of that to the party and I don't allow anybody else to. So therefore, I think you create, um, you just get rid of all the bullshit and you create an environment where people are just working towards one solid goal. But I also think reaffirming them goals is really important. Um, we, we did it last week where we just all stop, sit down, we have a meeting and we just talk through it and talk about exactly 
what we want to achieve and why we're doing it and how we're going to do it. And, and I think that having that clarity and uh, when you're working in an organization, you know, this is what we're trying to do and this is how we're going to do it. And this is the reason why we're doing this. I think having that clarity and communication, everybody's on the same page. Um, I think that's really important. And then non-negotiable behaviors as well. So there's certain things that you just don't compromise on. And, and that couldn't be anything from ethics to like standards of, of work. But I think certainly I will not compromise on egos or certainly in kitchens, any sort of bullying or macho behavior, anything like that. That's a non-compromisable situation for me. If anybody steps out of line in that way, they're gone because that's the most damaging thing that can happen to our organization. Um, and then other things that would be totally non-negotiable might be really simple things like how we put the orders away and how we rotate things and how we like systems so that everything else is perfect. I'm a big believer that if we have all the systems in place, we can't fail. And I think there's so many misnomers about our industry. Um, you see people shouting and screaming on TV and all this sort of thing. And I, I when I see a chef shout and scream, I just think, well, they're, they're very disorganized. Like, why would you ever put yourself in a situation where you're disorganized in that way? I, I like to break it down and become very detail orientated. Um, we created a piece of software um, which we have in all of our restaurants, uh, where every single detail of a table is recorded to the time. I know the time when your water's poured, I know the time when you left the table to go to the toilet and the time when you came back, I, everything is recorded on there and in, in a little, in like a, basically like a database of information for every table. So anybody in the restaurant, at any point can click on that table and they can see exactly how that evening is mapped. If we take out every detail that could possibly go wrong we stand a very good chance of being successful. And I think it's much more important to concentrate on detail and process rather than um, mouthing off about certain things or shouting. And so I think that's where people in our industry, we get this weird thing. If people concentrate on the detail rather than the ego, I think they'd be a lot more successful. I love that, Tommy. Concentrate on the detail, not the ego. And I didn't, so I, so I, we will talk about it shortly, but that it did, it did feel like there was this whole magic and knowing that there's this whole system behind it, because mm. it feels like it's, the service on Saturday wasn't, it wasn't in your face. It was like at the perfect time. So I'm almost seeing, revealing the, the, what's going on behind the stage doors, if you want to call it that. It's fascinating. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, that's the thing that you have to, you have to have a frightening amount of detail behind the scenes in order to have this seamless sort of almost casual service in, in front of the guest. Um, I mean, I think to, uh, the thing that I want the most is I encourage people to be themselves. So I want, uh, I think service is a, is like a performance art. Uh, I want people to express themselves. So when someone describes one of the dishes in our restaurants, it can't be just reading off a spiel. Like we've all been there and they, they are, this is this with this and this and this, you know, oh, thanks, cheers. It needs to be like, they need to feel it. It needs to be part of like the journey. They've been involved in that and, and deliver it. It's a performance art. And I think as long as you have everything else behind the scenes sorted, it allows people to step onto the stage and, and perform without worrying about whether something else is, because as a, as a serving staff, you've got a million and one things in your head, but if you know everything's looked after, you can then just deliver the, deliver the important thing. Yeah. There's a, I don't know who the, what the quote is, but there's a quote is like, the more you practice in private, the more you, pe people don't see what you practice in private, but what happens in public, basically there's a lot of discipline behind the scenes. Yeah. And one of my book, favorite books of all time that I've talked about probably way too much on this podcast is called the war of art really short little book if it's short i might give it yeah, yeah give it definitely <laughs> go mate because it, but it's all about like all this discipline behind the scenes is i think people think art whether it's food or i think actually art could be something like if messy and football or 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 art but behind the scenes is just relentless discipline non-negotiables practice and when by doing that it allows it to you know, even this podcast, like mm. I've done lots of prep for our conversation, for all the conversations, but it allows it to just sort of flow. Um, and what, when, when you said that ego is getting in the way, so, so from a hiring perspective, mm. what are some of the te not tests? Hiring is the hardest thing in the world mm. is what I've learned from ever I've interviewed. How do you make sure they are, they don't have egos mm. and they are going to, 
want to impress. Because I think you need a little bit of ego to impress or want to work hard because you want to be proud of yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think self-respect and That's ego are very different are different things. I I have a lot of conviction in what I do. Right. But I, 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 like, I really believe in what I'm doing. But I think that's different to, I think I, when I talk about ego, I think you're doing things or uh, expressing yourself upon other people in order to get a reaction that makes you feel good. I actually think ego usually comes from people who are not comfortable in their own skin, who maybe actually are riddled with insecurity. Whereas um, I'm not insecure and I'm very comfortable in what I'm doing. But that's not an ego. That's just, that's a happy place to be. And I think that's where people need to get to. When it comes to um, hiring, we don't tend to hire people in at management level. Everybody, uh, with, with some exceptions, but generally speaking, people start, because we're such a unique business and especially in like the kitchen, a lot of the ingredients we use, uh, we can go down to the farm and have a look in a bit, like a lot of the ingredients we use aren't things that people have ever come across before. So people kind of need to start towards the bottom of it and work up. Um, so therefore no one comes in with too much pressure on them. Um, and I, I think people spend time to be able to work their way up in the business. And, and you can see that across the board, all of our management have been in the business for years and they've worked their way up. So you become part of the culture and you, you drive the, the culture itself. But in terms of tests, there are none. I am not interested in that. I'm only, I'm only interested in character, not in ability, because you can teach and, or, or experience, you can teach people how to do things, but you, you can't do is make somebody a sensible, uh, empathetic, caring person, which is what I need a brigade of. Mm. And we need an organization full of good people. Mm. Um, and that is either a taught, that's not a taught skill, really. You, people adapt to the environment. And I do think we get the best out of people, but um, you get a good, I, I just go on first impressions on totally like, is this person a good person? Do I like them? They look genuine. Do I feel like the bullshit in me? If they just seem quite honest and humble, you got the job. Because everything else we can teach. Um, and, I, and I couldn't care. And I actually almost prefer inexperienced, but keen, enthusiastic, happy people than people who have a whole load of baggage and but some amazing experience. Um, certainly never. I know like some chefs do, oh, you've got to cook me an omelette or do whatever. I just think it's nonsense. I don't see the point because we're about training people. So... If somebody can't cook an omelet, I can teach them how to cook an omelet, but I can't teach them how to be driven necessarily. Or I can't teach them how to have empathy for uh, an understanding and um, to buy into the vision. Like, you know, we yeah. sit like this and just talk. Yeah, so we do sure. It. And I, I suppose I completely agree. It's, 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 it's almost looking for the apt, uh, attitude, not the aptitude almost, isn't it? Yeah. You can yeah. teach them that other stuff. Yeah. But I suppose for our listeners is, you know, empathy, humility. When I say test, I mean, is there like a way you kind of gauge that or is it just, it's just gut instinct? No, gut instinct. I mean, I have a rule of, and there's a few things that we've walked away from and everyone's like, I thought we were doing that and why have you walked away? This is sort of in business in general. I'm like, just didn't get a good vibe from the people. And I think as a general rule, if you don't do business with people who you don't like, then you can't go too far wrong because all business you do is, should be, in my opinion, if it's going to be have longevity and, and be sustainable, should be uh, a joint venture. It should be collective. You should both be working towards it. And if you don't feel, if you feel it's more transactional, if you feel like you don't like somebody or like, oh, we got to work with them, but they're a pain in the backside and their ethics aren't aligned with you, at some point it'll just blow up. It'll blow up in your face or you just won't get the most out of it or you won't feel good about that day. You're like, oh, I've got to go work with this brand tomorrow and oh god there's such a pain in the ass i don't really like the product and just don't do it and there's been a few times i've mean, done it recently where we were, we were supposed to work with companies and we've gone a bit down the line and i've just had just got an uneasy feeling about it i just don't feel the vibe um so we'll just walk away and a few times people are like that's stupid why have you done that but it's like well no i think you've got to use your gut um use your gut instinct and i think you do you know like you can judge people quite quickly whether you think people um I certainly know if someone's bullshitting me mm. and if they're bullshitting me, then I'm not interested. Um, and that's just the way you've got to go. It's really interesting because there's all this, I think it's a load of bollocks to be honest, all these sort of psychometric tests that these big law firms do. And I know they are trying to do it on mass. Yeah. But I think <clears throat> lots of our listeners are, are smaller businesses, challenger brands predominantly and some restaurateurs. And I think it's just this, 
searching for humility and going on the gut. And I, what you've saying to me is that I've taken on quite a few projects recently mm. and I'm at that mode where I, should, I won't say what they are, but I probably need to can a few off because I just don't see the longevity in it. Yeah. Um, Empathy, though, is something that's really important, I think. And I think there's a, I think there's often a misconception between sympathy and empathy. Uh, they're two totally different things. Uh, I'm not looking for someone to be sympathetic to everybody all the time, but I like to see that people can understand things from other people's point of view because that means that they're going to be a good team player. Um, so they're the sort of questions I'd ask. And if people have their own view but understand somebody else's view, then you know that's going to work because they can put themselves... So a good manager has to have high levels of empathy because in order to get the best out of somebody, you have to be able to understand their point of view. We can't just be like, well, this is what we're doing, but they're, they're doing this, they're doing it wrong, so they need to start doing this. I think like in order to actually get the person onto your path, you've got to understand their path first and then you can help guide them in the right direction. Um, so I think that's the number one skill. So that's the thing I, I would look for. And you get that in conversation though, because humble people who have empathy, when you just talk, they'll say, oh yeah, well I, you know, I've, I've got this idea, I want to do this. But I mean, we end up going this other direction. I get that and you understand that side, but I'd like to, and you're like, oh, perfect. You, whereas if somebody who doesn't have that would go, I want to do this, but they want to do that. So I said that was bullshit and I walked away. And you're like, hmm, yeah, I can see that you're not going to work because nothing's that straightforward. Like, I like to sit down with my management team and like, look, nothing's perfect in our business and there's always compromises. But we sit down and discuss it on a one-on-one -on -one and we understand each other's point of view. And like, they might want to do one thing and I kind of agree with them, but for practical reasons, we have to do another thing. And we talk it through and you understand each other's point of view and that's when there's a way forward. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think empathy is the number one characteristic. And that's on a really junior member of staff as well, because if you want to, take somebody through and they end up running your business one day for you they have to understand everybody's point of view they don't have to agree with it but they have to understand it yeah i love that and i think it's what you said there the difference between sympathy and empathy because i think i think i think people in business will the sort of the archetype of a business person has just completely changed it's a bit like back to the egos yeah back in the day that was the, the the ego of the chef the ego of the ceo yeah which was like, this is my way, we're doing it this way, everyone else will fuck off. That was kind of like, that's kind of how it was. And I think, but there is a difference between empathy and sympathy, because yeah. I think empathy, back to what you said there, you, you still got self-respect for your point of view, but you can see it from their side of the table. Yeah, you, you haven't moved on your point of view. Yeah. Um, whereas sympathising, you're like, oh, yeah, I, 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 yeah, they want that. And then you're almost appeasing and bending. And oh, no, I'm on my path. I understand where I want to go. But as long as I understand the other person's point of view, then I can, if I can understand their point of view, I can probably get them onto my point of view. But if I'm just sympathizing with them, then I'm compromising my situation. And is just from a leadership perspective, is there an example of where, because it's so true of how you understand their perspective and then from, from sort of sitting in their shoes, help them move to the right point. So is there like an example of that maybe in, in anything you've done really? I think uh, it's hard to do a really specific example, but I think we've made a lot of changes over the years where running restaurants is tough and like ours is hard sometimes. And and I've found it very difficult when we've, you know, probably been doing more hours than we should have been or we've been working people harder than we ought to have been because of the situation. I find it very hard to then be in there and work with them guys and look them in the face knowing that we're, we're all pushing a bit too much here. So I think, um, and you can see that people have found that tough. So we've made a lot of lifestyle decisions like closing Sundays and cutting hours right down and giving people extra, like, like the guys at Roots in the kitchen, they'll do four days a week, but every third week they do three days a week. And you really trying to make their lifestyle as good as you can. But mm -hmm. like, so you really seen, I really try and see things from their point of view. And I want them to have the most rounded life. But the payback is that when you come to work, we're in a high performance environment. So you don't dick around because you've got three or four days a week to dick around. But when you're at work, it, it's not that it's a highly disciplined, it is a highly disciplined environment, but not in a shouty, screamy way, just in a, like, it's a high performance way. Like we are creating the highest, we're working to the highest color, but we can, and everyone understands that and everyone buys into it. And I think that by not just riding a business and getting the most out of it you can as an employer. I think if you make it as, as great to work in that business as you can, 
I think the trade-off comes back round. So you've seen it from their point of view, you've made it as good as you can make it, then they see it from your point of view and they make it as good as they can make it. Mm. Yeah, enough. It's, it's almost, it goes back to that em- empathy piece. And I, I want to go back into, back into cricket. So yes. I think in cricket, and it, I suppose empathy is the greatest form of communication really between two people. Yeah. You've got empathy, you're on the same length. And what I want to talk about is in cricket, obviously you've got the bowler and the wicketkeeper needs to be in sync. Mm. Uh, two batsmen need to be in sync. Yeah. To, to to for high performance, as you said, I know your brother was is think is the front of house, or he was the front of house, yeah. and you're the kitchen. I'd love to understand the relationship between between the service and and the the, the storytelling of the food, because I mm. think you need high performance in the kitchen, but you almost need high performance in uh, with the services, which which we experienced yeah. on Saturday. Yeah. So how how do you do that? How do you do that? Um. Well, we've been on a real journey with that because obviously we we started very young and we were kids and stuff. And now we used to fight like cat and dog. And right. you know you learn you learn from things. And I think you know there was a lot of time we weren't particularly professional in our relationship. Um, but we have quite different roles now. Um, I think I think the key thing though is communication, and it isn't a kitchen and front of house thing. It's a just a team thing. Like we all sat around last Wednesday and we had a meeting, and we're all in the same. We're all trying to achieve the same thing. Um, so I think the more that you work as a team, the less that is, because at the end of the day, you are creating the same thing. Um, so I think we just try to cut any boundaries between the two and it's just one team who are delivering something. Um, but I think we have, you know, we have have 17 years of experience of that. And we used to fight, literally fight each other. And like as young, stupid boys who are, you know, probably had a little bit of ego at that point and they can see how it ruins things when as soon as you have um people who are working in that way you know brothers who are sort of competitive and fighting or whatever it's just not going to create a great working i mean people thought it was hilarious but it didn't create a great working environment whereas now i think we sort of sit more above it you know um neither of us are like day-to-day running the restaurant we have head chef and head chefs in both restaurants. We have restaurant managers in both restaurants, and we're more sort of overseeing that. We still work in the business, but um, it's more about trying to create the right environment and learning from some of the mistakes that we probably made, um, to be honest, um, and to help them. It's yeah, it's so yeah, it's, it's just fascinating seeing the, uh, what I learned. What I'm learning live, I suppose, is this empathy dissolves this ego. Mm. As as you become more empathetic, you dissolve the ego, but yeah, I mean, I've got a little brother and we used to fucking argue with all the yeah. time growing up. It's and, like... And, you know, we used to argue a lot and occasionally we do. The problem with arguments is they don't actually... It's not a debate, it's an argument. Mm. And when you find yourself arguing, one person rants and the other person rants. And as the other person's ranting, you're thinking about your next rant and how you're going to respond to them. So actually, it's not a nuanced debate. It's just no one's listening to each other. There is no empathy. If you're arguing with me, I'm not listening to a word you're saying. I'm just thinking about how I'm going to fucking get you next time and and vice versa. And you listen to it, you think, well, that's not a constructive conversation. So what we try and do now, and it's difficult with family because you tend to be able to be less professional with family because you speak to each other in a different way sometimes, especially when tensions are, uh, are ramped up. But I think what we try and do is calm, not allow anyone to raise the voice. Because as soon as you raise your voice, you're arguing, and then it doesn't, and then and then just try and actually debate things. I'm not saying we're, we're perfect. I think that's, I think my communication with all the 120 people who work in our business is very very good. My communication with my brother is good, but I think that's the only time when I feel myself ever so slightly unprofessional. Because sometimes you've got to like point score a little bit, yeah, <laughs> yeah. with a little, we, we do it to each other. But I mean, the other thing is, at least you know it's not personal, and you can you can walk away. Um, but I think that's the hardest dynamic. Um, so my other business partner, Matt, like, you know, if it's slight, like, if we slightly like disagree on something, you have a really constructive debate and you find out the best way forward for the business hundred percent every time, even if one of us has to concede some ground, you're doing it for the right reasons. Whereas with my bro, occasionally it's like, we just, we do get there in the end, but there's a bit more point scoring involved and then it's, it's a shame, but I'm happy to admit it. No, it's good. And I think if you can, if you can have that with your brother, again, it goes back to, I have that with my brother, even if we're like we're going to the pub, my parents, if there's something comes up, yeah. well, I'm not thinking, I'm just thinking, Jake, I want to, like, you're wrong, mate. If yeah. it's in my yeah. head, I was like, mate, you were wrong. I don't give a fuck what you're saying. <laughs> and it's, that actually reminds me, 
not necessarily about family relationships, but more about business. But Paul Ainsworth taught me something, which is listen to reply, um, listen to grow, not to reply. I think so many people listen. They're not listening. They're just they're just thinking. Right, I just want to say something to you to shut you up. Yeah, and actually listen to to grow through the empath- empathetic side of things is yes is interesting. Um, so I want to kind of go into my experience on Saturday because it was unreal. Some of that food, mate, I can't even. It was just mind boggling. It was so so good. On your website, it says the foundations of food are the same. After that, you're simply painting the same picture with with new and exciting paints. And I thought that's really just a succinct and sort of delicious way to describe it. But I'd love to know for you, and I asked this to Paul as well, is food art or magic to you? I'm a little bit more holistic than that. Go on. Um, Because obviously I come from a farming background and like, when we finish this interview, we can go down to the farm and it's a beautiful day. And it's more than art or magic because I don't feel like I'm not the creator, if you know what I mean. Like if you go down to the farm now, there's little baby lambs that have been born and they're Herdwick. So that's a slow growing breed. So they won't be ready for the menu for 18 months. And it's actually, you have to shepherd them through their life. Or we can go down to Pointles and you see these first little shoots growing. Or you go into the Palace of Preserve and you see all the fermentation and things like that. I don't really see it as art or magic. I actually have a much more... It's nature and I feel like we're we're totally dictated by that. And I know that sounds so flowery and so chefy. No, but but in the, from a farmer's point of view, like our menu is... We could say we could create a perfect piece of art... Uh, and it could have um, five different flowers on that are all grown in the garden and we we pick them every day at half past five but then it might piss it down and you know what I mean and then that's mm-hmm. di- di- that actually dictates to us so I'm not um, we're a little bit more than than that in terms of, and I think like in a lot of for a lot of chefs it would be a bit a bit of both I think art in terms of making the dishes and magic in terms of the service would probably be a really nice way of putting it but I don't feel like we're creating perfect pieces of art. I think we're uh, working with the land and the seasons of what we've got to sort of give an expression. I guess it's more uh, uh, in- interpreted art, you know, like it's an expression of what is going on here and where we're at on our journey, if you know what I mean. No, completely. Uh, oh. But I do see chefs who create pieces, what I would say more like art, but I don't think they're working as closely with nature. They're more like constructing beautiful masterpieces and I have so much respect for that, but I think we're on a different path. I love that. So so Paul Ainsworth said the same thing. He said the, 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 the food is the art and the, the service is the magic. Mm. So it's both really. Yeah. But actually, and I think there was a listen to, I think it was Marco Pierre White with um, Anthony Bourdain, I think, where he said Mother Nature's the artist. Mm. which I thought was a really good quote because it's like, <laughs> and it's it's so, it makes so much sense here in this restaurant because we are literally in a big pudding of countryside. But I think when you go to some London restaurants, it, it is kind of like you don't see as a consumer or as a being in a restaurant, you don't see the whole back end piece and no. the nature piece. Um, yeah, I, th- I find that fascinating. And y- you do a lot of, uh, foraging mm. and I think on your Instagram it's like chef, restaurateur, forager I, think yeah. I don't know what it is but. yeah I can't remember I think about changing that actually <laughs> <laughs> but how how does what does foraging add to your life like well I mean so firstly I think it just gives you an amazing appreciation of of nature because you get excited about when things happen and it makes you much more seasonal uh, but in terms of what how it affects our food is more, it's a palette of ingredients. Like any chef can ring up a supplier and order some vanilla pods or, um, I mean, what's in season now around the world, or Alfonso mango or some blood oranges or something, yeah. which are beautiful, amazing products. Um, but what excites me is expressing sort of the where we're actually from. And I love the idea of taking certain things. So, so this tree outside, you can see the first bits of blossom are just starting to come through. Uh, this odd bit peak proof. If we get a bit of sun this week, by the weekend, that'll be bright pink in cherry blossom. Beautiful. 
we can forage. We can, we'll stand on top of this, um, <laughs> this bay window and you just pick it all off. And that gets infused into vinegars or syrups has the most amazing sort of, um, well, they call it Sakura in Jap in Japan. And it's a botanical they use a lot in like gins and stuff. We can use that in cocktails. We could use it to finish sauces. It becomes like a staple ingredient. What I love is when we create food, which looks recognizable, but is made using ingredients that people don't know what the hell they are, because actually we have a different palette of ingredients. If I want to achieve a vanilla flavor, I use sweet woodruff. If I want to find a, a marzipani vanilla flavor, a uh, marzipani almondy flavor, I'll use some sort of blossom that would be around this time of year. And, and it just goes on and on. Um, but the beauty of doing foraging it and preserving it is all those ingredients of which I literally have tons of, mm. which is all perfectly organized is like, uh, it's like a chemistry set or a painter's palette. You can go and you can take a little bit of that, a little bit of that, and you can mix it together and create something which is our own mm. because foods, food's been done. Like it's very hard to be original nowadays unless you create the original food, the original ingredient before it even becomes the dish. Mm. So that I think some of our, we have a lot of different interesting techniques in the kitchen, but I think some of them you'll see in other places but you won't see the ingredients. A lot of our ingredients are unique to us because we've invented them. Mm. Like we have a different palette of ingredients and that's what really excites me. Um, and, and I think by using that, there's certain things that we forage that just other people don't have because they simply just don't have that tree that we have. So that gives you that instant flavor. I don't like using the word terroir because it's French and shit, <laughs> but like it is like the flavor of that tree there is different to the flavor of any other tree in the world. So therefore we have a unique thing that nobody else has. Mm. And that's, we invest so much time and money in, in that. Well, that was because that was the dish, the Woodruff dessert on yeah. Saturday. I was thinking this is mental because it's yeah. three different types of mushrooms, isn't it? It's like, the best, uh, it's the best dish on the menu. I think that. The I thought that was unbelievable. I couldn't, I was, mm. it was sort of back to the magic and the art like that. My. Yeah. I was tasting and looking at art, but then I was like, what the fuck is going in a, in a good way? I said, yeah. what the fuck is going on? This is insane. Um, it's uh, so, to, but I think like, so if you broke that down into its building blocks and you said, oh, there's like different sorts of twills and meringues on that dish, there's crumble, there's ice cream, there's ganache, there's caramel. They're all things that are on other people's menus, those ingredients, because they're like techniques, yeah. but there's, all the other things in there, whether it's the different, it's like the different baby lots or the, um, the, the, the seps that we forage from up here or the birch polypores, which are different sorts of mushrooms or whether it's the sweet woodruff or the smoked butter, it's the chicory root that we grow. All those things, it's impossible for anybody to recreate that dish. Absolutely impossible. People can make something that looks like it, but they can't recreate that flavor. That's unique to us. Mate, I love that. And I, I love exploring. I want to ask you the parallels of like almost foraging with business because I think in challenger brands, at least in sort of supermarkets, is if, if you look where everyone else is looking, that nothing is original, like you're saying. So if you go into a supermarket now, so many of the products look the same. Even to, to be honest, a lot of in, in London, all the pizza joints and pizza restaurants all look the same. It's all this Neapolitan mm. saying they're all just carbon copies. Yeah, it's fashion. It's fashion, yeah. And you've got to go look where. One, no one else is looking, and mm. two, where people don't have access to that tree. Yeah, yeah. And then you create originality. Mm. So, but I'd love to kind of go into that with you, Tommy. How do, how does foraging make you better as a, as a entrepreneur, I suppose? Because I think actually just the location, I think I'd find it much more difficult to be original in a city because we're so out the way. If I don't look at Instagram, I don't really know what's going on in the rest of the world, to be honest. So you end up just much more narrow, but then much more open in your thinking. Cause you're not, um, you're not sort of bound by, by sort of industry norms or fashions or, or whatever. You sort of just plow in your own furrow. Um, I think there's, there's a few things to that. Um, when I was younger, I used to sort of follow other restaurants, things like that. And don't really know. I mean, I know a lot of the chefs and stuff. I bump into them and stuff and like, I have good relationship with people, but I don't really know what food they're cooking. Not that interested. I'm, I'd love to go to the restaurant and try it. Like I'll enjoy it. I'm not really that interested in what people are doing. Um, and I think also because I didn't go and work in lots of restaurants when I was younger, I'm not like classically trained. I don't have any of that desire or any of those sort of, um, what's the word? Um, 
any of those sort of formalities and sort of expectations that, that, that other people would have had of what things need to be. Um, so I think it's very easy to just suddenly, you end up going down on a tangent down a road path and people go, wow, this is so creative. And you're like, well, it's just quite obvious actually, we just did this, this and this. And we're sort of living our own little bubble down here. And I, and I like that. I don't really want to be influenced by the outside world. I quite like it that people come into our world and, and see what we do. But obviously there are so many crossovers when we do different strings of our business and we do go out, it's all right selling that dream here, but it's how we do it at Lord's Cricket Ground or, or Twickenham or with our other brands that we run and stuff like that. So I think that's that's where there's more challenge. Mm. It's all this this whole place here, Oldstead is this sort of magic, I think. Yeah. And then I, not even in the restaurant, just just here in general. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful part, part of the world, world yeah. And so how do you do it at when you are going to say more mass stream, you're doing Twickenham, you're doing the cricket, mm. but how do you have the, the <laughs> making it more mainstream, mm. but having that little sprinkle or, you know, a bit of panache of, of banks basically. Yeah. Um, well, so we do a, quite a lot of outside catering gigs through our, um, company made in Oldstead and, uh, it very much every everything's different basically. Um, so we run an amazing restaurant at Lords, which is quite exclusive, and we very much bring it all down. Like we have plants brought down from the polytunnels, we have all our preserves there, and we kind of deliver that, and we kind of create our own little atmosphere. But the nice thing about the restaurant there is it's totally soundproof. It's the only soundproof place in the ground. So you step out the door, and it's like thirty thousand people cheering on the cricket. You step in, it's just serene and airy and mm. beautiful. So we've created this different sort of environment. So that that's amazing. And it's something like Twickenham is a totally different vibe, but I mean, I absolutely love it. It's bouncing. It's so much fun. I think that's down to the ingredients. Like, um, you know, we'll still cook food, which is our style. We'll do things which are, you know, even if it's just like the pork for the pork pies comes from our farm and it's served with a, um, a mayweed jelly on top of it and that's, maybe that's forage from the farm. We're still using the same ingredients, but we're making things which are, uh, are suitable for that environment. Mm. Yeah, I think there's just, there's so much in that for people listening to this in terms of, I really love originality and new ideas and being like no one else. I think if you try and be like everyone else, you just, it's very crowded. Yeah. And it, I, I think there's so much in that. What I want to talk about, so both your restaurants, actually, the names of both your restaurants have really interesting uh, conversation sort of pathways mm. so the black black swan is where i want to talk talk about and one of my favorite books is called black swan i don't know mm. if you've ever heard of it but there's black swan events basically which uh well a black swan event is uh, is an unpredictable and unforeseen event typically with one with extreme consequences so yeah. the ob obvious one is covid uh, and this guy by, the, by this guy called nasim taleb and i, I like his stuff uh, a parent passing away is a black... We all have black swan events. We basically have two options. We either let it crush us or, as Taleb says, we become anti-fragile and that's basically things that gain from from disorder. Mm -hmm. And I know you, you had a disease called... So I'm going to butcher this, mate, called ulcerative... Ulcerative. <laughs> ulcerative. It's actually really quite easy. <laughs> ulcerative colitis, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, you, you said you'd spent um, a lot of time in hospital. I think you had three, three upper free yeah. operations yeah. and you, you said sometimes you need a setback to make you realize your calling in life mm. i think the illness defined my character giving me resilience to be successful as a young chef i think part of life is 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 resilience mm. and i'd love to go into into this and what was sort of the darkest day on that hospital bed and what did that feel like well i was quite young so i was only eight 17 18 19 at uh, that sort of stage I, th I think what i mean by that is that's why I, I mean, I wasn't unintelligent at school or anything, but I wasn't really naughty, but I just, just wasn't focused. And so I sort of left school. I did one year of A-levels, left school, and my dream was to be a professional cricketer. But if I'm honest, I was just an idiot teenager who just loved playing sport. I liked going out drinking with my friends and just wasn't that keen on knuckling down doing any sort of hard work, to be honest, which is probably the story of most sort of 17-year-old lads especially. Uh, and that's where I was at. And I uh, sort of arranged to go and play cricket in the following winter in Australia. And I still sort of harbored this. If I wasn't going to, if I didn't make it as a professional cricketer, I would be a, I'd work in the sport in some way. I'd, I'd, I'd go into like, I don't know, uh, training, coaching or something. I don't know. And that was my path. Um, and we'd 
but James had done something similar. My brother, and he'd sort of left school. He was just working as a barman. And mum and dad run a bed and breakfast at the farm. And they were like, oh, maybe we should give the Black Swan a go. And um, so we took, took over and sort of left us to it, which was rogue. Um, <laughs> but when I was first sort of 17 and working, I, I hated it. I had no interest in it. I'd wash some pots. I did a few desserts and stuff. And I carried food out. And they, I mean, it was a fairly ropey village pub sort of thing. Um, but then I got ill and all of the things that you have in youth were taken away from me as in like my health and fitness. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a fairly big guy, but I, I was, I was like 10 stone. No, I'm like 16, really? I'm like 16 stone. You know, I'm six foot three and big chap, but like I wasn't then. And, uh, ulcerative colitis is a, is a terrible disease because, uh, what actually is it? Sorry. So it's disease of it, autoimmune disease of your colon. So uh, there's also, you hear of like Crohn's disease, which is very similar, but it's your smaller intestine and basically your body starts fighting itself. Um, so, um, you feel like very unwell, um, and in a lot of pain. And, and of course the big problem is that you basically on the toilet all the time, which makes, I think is why a lot of people don't get diagnosed quick enough is because it's a bit of a thing that people don't want to talk about, you know, yeah. um, you, you know, they start off having a lot of stomach pains and feeling very tired. And then you find yourself passing lots of blood and then it just sort of spirals from there. And it can be, um, controlled with, with drugs. Um, and usually it, um, it is stress related and it could often come from a trigger point. And when I was that age, my grandfather died and he was being like real, like a father to me as well. Like, um, really, really close to my granddad. Um, I still think about him every day and this was what, 14 years ago. Um, but, um, that I think is what flared up the disease in me because I think it stays dormant in you and that was what causes disease to happen. So I think not only had I had this, um, bereavement, which really hit me hard, I, I got this disease and then my body just shut itself down and I, I lost all this weight and I was pretty much bedridden. Um, they couldn't control it with drugs because it was just too aggressive. Um, so I had to have my colon removed and I had a colostomy bag, which is the least cool thing you can have as a 17 year old lad, to be honest. Mm. So if you've got to think from being like a bit of a Jack the lad, just like loving life, like interested in what drinking, playing sport and girls, those three things didn't exist anymore. And suddenly all your friends are going off to university and you're just staring at four walls in pain, spending most of your life on the toilet. Like, it's a uh, humbler. Uh, I think like I was pretty dark. Um, it was, I was pretty depressed, but also it gave me this sort of drive. I was like, wow, when I get better, I am not going through this. Like, I am making a success in my life because this is crap. I don't want to, I'm not hanging around for, for nobody. Um, but I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, and obviously there was an obvious outlet because we had a restaurant, a, a pub then that I could cook in. And also chefs sort of became really popular on TV. So, um, I just sort of spent my time sort of stewing. Uh, Sorry, just to get context, what year was this? This was 2007, right, 2008, okay. 2009, that sort of time. Yeah. Um, so I had three major operations and over the course of a couple of years, and then I was sort of back on my feet, but it took a long time to sort of get strong. Uh, and I just threw myself into cooking. So I, then, and, and it was an un, unhealthy drive, I think now in hindsight, like I didn't really do, I hadn't been having a social life for so long because I physically couldn't, uh, that I was just threw myself into work and I sacrificed everything for work. Like I worked every day of the week. So I wanted to, I was just determined to be successful. I'd found myself a kid who left school with no qualifications and then had all my health taken away from me and I'd lost two, three years of my life and I just needed to play catch up. So I had this very unhealthy idea that, well, if I work 80, 90 hours a week, then I'm working twice as much as a standard person works. So I'm going to get on twice as fast as them and I'll catch up and overtake them. It was just, was my attitude. And I was just, I was just relentless for a few years. Um, it wasn't sustainable and it didn't necessarily, it was, it made me uh, successful in my career, but not necessarily <laughs> successful in all areas of life. Yeah. And I think, I think, I mean. Yeah, it's just so amazing to see you now, you know, for all these years on with this, well, restaurateur. And I, but I, and to be honest, everyone I've interviewed has, has a period of unhealthy drive. Yeah. And to be honest, right now with this podcast is, 
on like, it's a seven day a week. It's not ninety hours a week. I don't have that sort of stamina. But it's an every, me neither. <laughs> it's an everyday sort of, and I'm sort of thinking to myself, like, am I getting too obsessed with this? Mm. Is this is because it's like I'm driven by fear. Because like, those people said, don't bother signing a podcast, Dan. Don't bother doing that. And so I'm just like almost a bit like, fuck you, watch this, watch this. And I don't know how how sustainable it is, but it's it's what's getting me going yeah. through. Yeah. But you said I'd love to know, like, did you burn out? Did, did you did you burn yes. out? Because I don't know if... I think it's a really interesting nuanced thing because you need a shitload of drive yeah. to get anything, to, to really make something yourself. Mm. But sometimes that can spill into burnout. Did, did you burn out? Yeah, yeah, a lot of times, yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, um, I think it was a lot easier when I was just working here. So obviously I was working all hours, um, driving it forward won a mission star, did all that sort of thing. But I think it became harder when I had to perform more, as in like be on show all the time, whether it was to guests or you're doing TV or like actually the people who come in, your employees who come in to work for you are no longer just like the six of you in the kitchen, you're just having a laugh. Like you're employing lots of people and, and, and you need to always have a good sort of face on. That's when I started to find it more difficult. But no, no, I've I've suffered with with, with burnout. It's certainly a real thing. Uh, right through my twenties, I'm desperately trying to be more sustainable and cut down the number of times that happens a year. Um, to be honest, and that's that's a journey that I've. I think as you get older, you understand yourself, your mind, and your body more. Um, and I'm definitely making positive, uh, made some really positive steps in the last couple of years, especially not to not to do that. But it it's a fine line. It really is. Um, you, without the drive, you're not, you don't create the things, but it, it's a vicious circle. I think it's almost, I was talking to my mate about this who came on the podcast the other day. It's almost like, I always think of drive as, as the, you know, water when you're cooking pasta. Mm. Is that, it just gets you going, 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 going. And then it's like, it gets too much, too much. It just bubbles over. Like, yeah, yeah. Because I'd, I'd love to know, how, how do you, because I'm really bad at spotting the signs of burnout. Like, mm. how do you know it's coming? And when it is, how do you sort of, let it simmer down is that because i think it's that is a as you said it's a journey i think mm. that's a, that's a mm. craft in itself is knowing when to sort of ease off a bit uh i think my wife's been really good at that um, right so um i certainly you i would just go through a through a time where i would i'd work ferociously and then suddenly i would just have these anxiety attacks panic attacks burnout i'd have two days in bed and then i'd be back at it and i just fly at it again and i, I think she's been really good at telling me when I'm getting there or telling me to working with me to try and stop me from sort of doing that really. Um, I think, I think it's an interesting thing though, because I also think some are creatively, some of my best ideas come when I'm on the edge of sort of in a bit of almost a manic state in between them <laughs> when my body's about to sort of shut down on me. Um, Such as any idea, any examples of that? Um, mm. Pretty much everything, to be honest. Yeah. Everything that we've ever done, I think, has come at that sort of time. I'll have like a crazy idea, and I'll have so much energy for it, and I'll go down and tell all my family, like, "We're well, going to do, we can do this." And then usually it coincides with a few days later. I just end up in bed. Um, that's that's true. Um, but no, like, I'm I am absolutely just for the record, like, not saying that working yourself to that point is a good thing. I think it's a really bad thing, and I've felt the the wrath of that over the last few years. I think both me and my brother have, to be honest. And I think that's why we're very much trying to make sure that everybody within our care will never be like that and learn from mistakes. I find it a lot with young people who are like so ambitious and like, Chef, I just want to speak to you. How am I going to, um, I just want to push forward. I'm just like, no, you're doing a great job. Just just be you. You know, you're, you're 23 or something. Just enjoy your life. Honestly, you're on a great path. Within a couple of years, you'll be here. With a couple more years after that, you'll be there. Don't drive yourself any higher than you need to because you've already got the drive. You're fine. Yeah, uh, it's it's, it's like, hypocritical, I know, but like, uh, I'm absolutely not saying it's a good thing. Yeah, no, and I love doing these because I learn for myself. So, because I get, I think when it comes to me, because I'm, I'm still trying to work out when it is, last time I was saying to myself, even this is like last mm -hmm. week, because I've done so many interviews. <laughs> I take on probably almost too much work in terms mm. of the project stuff, mm. and I just get this crippling self doubt where, and it just comes down like almost like thunderstorms, yeah. and I'm just like, but then I've got this 
again, it's probably a bit fucked up, but this sort of addiction to work. Like, I love it. This is the issue. Mm. So I, mm. To me, this is play. Like, yeah. I love doing it and I, I love, but it's just trying to work out when, when that's, and if I think for me, it's loads of self-doubt. Yeah. And just this feeling of like, no, like, excitement to do something. Is that, how, how does it manifest for you? That's, uh, I think that you say it's like a classic burnout thing when, when you, you lose sort of excitement for it. I never lose the passion or the drive. No, it, it's more, um, physical and uh more anxiety driven so i'll just get to a point where i can do anything I'll, in the lead up to it i can i'm invincible i can do anything and then i just suddenly fall off a cliff and i'm just like i can't see people today but i think the best way to manage work no matter even if you've got the busiest time the thing you can't compromise on is sleep and i used to hear sh chefs and you know, like Gordon Ramsay, I remember having a bucket and like a quote saying that four hours of sleep is enough for anybody, blah, blah, blah. any more than that. And you're just being lazy or something. So I was just like, as a young chef, I was like, oh, right, that must be right then. Mm. That's absolute bollocks. And I'm sure if you got interviewed today, you wouldn't say that. Um, if you can keep on top of your sleep, then you can, you know, because we, we all go through periods in life where we've got an awful lot on. But if you, so long as you're getting some sleep, the other thing for me that I've found uh, as well is is like you tend to be busy, you, then you tend to be here, there and everywhere and you tend to drink more and things like that because you're in like an environment where like you're doing, especially for me, it's like it's like going and doing events or TV shows and back and doing this and you end up bumping into people, you have a few beers, you get to bed too late and that's when it just gets too much. I think if you're more professional and you don't, if you get your sleep and you don't drink too much, you can usually achieve a lot more. I think the message of your head more than anything, losing out on the sleep. Oh, for sure. And I'm, I'm a bit weird, like I always try and wake up ridiculously early, but I'm just, now I'm sort of getting to the point, it's like, it's, you almost, almost like how you were saying to your chef, it's like, you it just chill, mate. Like, try, I, I can't do it, it's, it's impossible. It's the psychological side, which I think I've got way better at the last few years, is when you have time off, you need to try and do it well. And I know I'm not good at it still, but I used to almost have this guilt. If I wasn't at work, I'd feel guilty for not being at work. And then I would just be racking myself for that all day. So I don't think I actually achieved any of the uh, rest and recuperation you were supposed yeah, to do. Yeah. Uh, whereas now I, I feel a little bit, uh, generally I feel a lot more content. Like I'm happy if I'm off on Saturday and having a nice time with my wife and my daughter or whatever. I don't feel bad that guys are working in the restaurant, whereas I used to. Like So that's why I would just be here all the time and there every, and just... I would work when everyone was off work and I'd work when everyone was at work. Whereas I just have to realize I'm doing a different, I'm on a different path to other people. It's fine. No, it's good. Like quite, it's a guilt thing. Yeah. It's it's a, that's it was the same with me. Is I've got definitely, it's just reassuring speaking to someone and sort of talking through it basically. Yeah. Oh, and the other one I want to talk about now is roots. Yes. So I want to go into your Yorkshire roots, obviously, um, mm. you know, the other very famous chef from, from Yorkshire's market, Pierre White. Um, and I listened to a podcast you did and, and you said, I think it, it, it was, a, I think we were in maybe Staffordshire doing a podcast uh, uh, during, uh, yeah, the, the nightcap one with Paul. Yeah. 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 That was it. Yeah. It was really, really, really good. But I think you said, you, you know, you weren't a perfectionist, you said your mum was a perfectionist, but you weren't a perfectionist yeah. and you had no formal training. Yeah. So the archetype of a chef is someone who is a perfectionist and someone who's got, you, you know, mm. got, got the formal training. So in a world where perfection and training are sort of like revered, how did having no formal training and not being perfectionist actually help you win Michelin star, win the second Michelin star, open the second restaurant? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, I do. So I, th I think there's, there's quite a journey in that front. I mean, like, I, I wouldn't say, I, I don't think I'm capable of being a perfectionist because I don't think I have like, just like the motor skills to do it, if you know what I mean. Like some people are just so precise and great. I mean, I, I just, I try very hard. Uh, I think uh, I don't compromise though. And I think that's, so what's the difference between perfection? I think people who are perfectionists, and I'm not a perfectionist because I don't think I'm almost capable of achieving it in a lot of ways, uh, but I don't compromise on things. Like I have a standard that I will not compromise on. And I think that's, been the secret to success um but then after that and in in, in more recent years actually it's, it's about surrounding yourself with people who are better at doing something than you are so i don't think i'm the single best at doing anything in our business at all i'm not 
and that's um that's really important and i think that is the secret to success i think the thing that i'm probably best at in the business is probably one-on-one communication and group communication and having having vision but other than that technical skills for anything from computer things to running anything there's somebody better at it than me every, everywhere across the business but i just sort of I'm the I'm the football manager, not the star. I'm not Lionel Messi. Mm. I'm more Pep Guardiola, mm-hmm. and I think I always will be. But I think that's where the recruitment, nurturing, creating a great environment, it comes in. I employ people who are perfectionists, and that's important. Yeah. But I'm not. That's I love this. I love doing these because you get so much nuance and things. It's almost like you said. There's a difference between almost perfection but you but your your role almost as a manager is as talking for football is to bring that standard up yeah so i know we talked right at the beginning about <laughs> non-negotiables and standards what are some of those standards and, and non-negotiables that have got you here today um well i mean they're, they're across the board i think uh i think having like strong principles whatever they might be help filter down into sort of quality you sort of be Q, QC sort of checks because I think like it's a funny one because in a kitchen a lot of it is sort of quality control isn't it it's like making sure everything's the same and perfect and nobody ever steps out of line in that respect but I think what that comes from is actually just drive and culture and I think the fact that I'm so passionate about the journey that we're on whether it's sort of like the regenerative farming model or whether it's training and bringing people through or the fact that I'm totally uncompromising when it comes to the culture within our business people can see that uh, no that like that's that is the way we do things and there's a real drive there's something you can buy into because it's clearly spelled out to you I think that fills down quite well into the QC side Mm -hmm. which is which is really really important um but also we just have lots of boring systems in place which you have to have which are just you know and I actually I think a lot of a lot of times in hospitality those things aren't there because it's just a bit more organic whereas we've sort of tried to combine the best of both worlds we've got this sort of holistic organic approach but also behind the scenes there there are everything is non-negotiable really right. um in terms of how we conduct ourselves in terms of how we but then how we make an individual thing it's like very regimented like and I think I've got some great people within the business who help to to make sure that happens mm. as well. And what are what are some of the the bank's principles that are kind of under almost they're like the roots. Yeah, the principles like roots. I think that mm. make you unshakable. Almost like you're looking like a tree that when things come this way, if you've got strong roots, you're not going to get moved. Mm. So that, yeah. yeah, I think it's a it's a respect thing. Um, I have a great relationship with everybody who works in the business. So I think there's just a respect there that I can sit down with people. I know they know I'm not mugging them off or taking advantage of them or they know I've got like I genuinely care and, but they genuinely care about the business and me too. And it, and it works. I, I, I really feel that like, uh, Josh, who's a really good lad. He'd been with us for a few years and it was his leaving drinks. Last night. I was just sat talking to him and it was just like, you know, for me, like we have, once you, you've come into this environment, you're part of this environment for life. Like Josh is a member of our family now. Like whenever he comes this way, he'll come up to the farm and see us. I was talking, we'll talk about it. It's like, well, no, I'm 60 and he's 56. We worked out. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll still be mates because we're on the same page. And I think it's just about having shared uh, ideals and shared principles. Um, and that's, I guess you're asking me, why are they? So it's integrity is massive. Uh, I like respect, I like integrity. I want people, no matter who they are, they've got to work together to achieve something. And I think as soon as you all buy into it, you treat each other well, everything else goes together because you're enjoying being in each other's company. And as soon as you're enjoying each other's company, then you're like, well, what can we, what can we achieve together? Mm. And that's exciting. Mm. And honestly, I mean, I think I must be the worst. If someone's tuning in to listen to this thing, they get loads of like foodie, chefy stuff. I'm probably the worst interview for that because I believe so heavily in creating culture and a great working environment. And like that's honesty, integrity, treating each other well, respect for each other, and then trying to take that and achieve something together with people who you, like problems aren't, 
problems need to be embraced. Like every running a business is about solving problems. But if you can be solving problems with people you not just respect, but people that you know and like, then you're doing it together and it's a problem that's shared and the problem solving becomes easier because that's basically what you do. No matter what business you run, it's a problem solving business. What's been the biggest problem and how did you solve that? As Because again, I think mm. there's a, a get back to this sort of the obstacle is the way thing. I think. Yeah. So, so there's been a lot. Um, I think 2008 was the first one. So that was the economic crash uh, in 2008. And we were running this Black Swan as like a simple village pub sort of thing. But we're in the middle of nowhere and there's about 15 houses in the village. So instantly, what did you do? Like pubs were closing like daily in the UK at that time. Um, we, for about two weeks, we did the discount thing, like um, state nights, buy one, get one free or whatever. No one's traveling out to the middle of nowhere for a bargain thing because you can get a bargain thing anywhere. Mm. So we decided to go the other way, put our prices up and try and make it really good and make it into a destination. And that was painful. That took years, but we stuck at our guns and we made it into a destination. That's the only way we survived. Um, and then obviously endured plenty of success after then. The next, the biggest obstacle there was COVID probably. COVID really, um, really stopped us in our tracks um, because we don't have backers. Like we are, it's just us and we're, we've done it ourselves. So we don't have endless money just to throw at something. Um, obviously COVID closes down in both restaurants, but um, also sort of the business model, we yeah. ticketed restaurant. So people pay in advance, but you got to give all that money back. And suddenly you just don't have the money to actually pay the staff or anything. I know there's furlough, but it's not for free. Um, and the other, the problem I also found with that was, um, we had members of staff who'd, we just ran, we'd have six or seven members of staff who just started. And, um, the furlough was, if you started a new job after a certain date, you couldn't get paid. I can't remember the exact dates. So I remember like, I'm going to Max, he's a really good guy. He actually just got promoted to junior Sue the other day um he was living in the staff accommodation in the village down there and i remember just walking down to see him like, all right so this is what the crack is match we've got to close the restaurant down it was just like he's like well i can't go home um because his, his mum was quite ill at the time so she she needed to isolate and stuff he's like i can't go home how i don't have a job but like how can i get paid and i was like right well we'll just start making food boxes and delivering them and me and you'll do it mate and we'll just make them and then whatever money we get I'll pay you out of it and I'll start paying off some of our customers mm. and that's what we'll do. So we started off in here, uh, there was about four of us doing it in here and then my mum and dad, my brother, my business partner, Matt, and my mother-in-law and my wife <laughs> would just like drive around the villages, dropping them off. Um, and it was a difficult one because we had such a, everybody wanted their money back that they'd paid because we were closed. Um, and obviously we just didn't have all that money to give back. So I was basically ramped up this business within weeks and we were say selling the boxes out here i was taking that money we're giving it to the guests paying the staff going and rolling and rolling within four i did it for four weeks here and i got up to a few hundred boxes and then um a friend of mine who had an industrial kitchen that had been closed down um as well, well he supplied like cruise ships and um football stadiums, stuff like that, which all that business has stopped. I managed to take the lease on from him on that industrial unit. And I just started bringing people back to work by the June. So a lockdown was obviously end of March, 2020. By the June, 2020, I had 35 people back to work and we were doing what we're doing, 1500. So we're doing minimum for 3000 people a week we were cooking for, or we were delivering nationwide. Um, and we managed to pay off all of our debts and everything that come out by COVID and create 30 odd jobs. But then the, inf what we managed to do like as well was bring back so many other employees, so many people indirectly as well in all the other local businesses. Um, so that was a massive, that was the biggest one. I think every time we've been hit with something like that, you come out swinging and you get your thinking cap on and you just have to be more creative. So we were the, so the I think the biggest probably success story in sort of terms of the, the food box thing. We started made in Olstead. It was hard. We knew nothing about e-com. We knew nothing about logistics. Um, so overnight we had to become an e-commerce logistics business. 
if you look at like uh, Hello Fresh or something, I don't think they see themselves as a food bot, a food business. They see themselves, yeah, yeah, yeah. and e-commerce logistics, yeah. uh, and that's what we had to do. So, but also we had to create food, and we had to make sure it shelf life, and we make sure it packaged, and how would we deliver it on the other side? And we had to, well, within our business, we had all these people, and none of them had that skill set, and we didn't have it. So we all had to learn overnight. It was like an episode of The Apprentice every day. You just try not to get fired. It was literally like that. Um, but we had this ridiculous t time with that where to a point where you'd have like 40, 50,000 people a week would want our boxes and we'd be doing like 1,500 of them. Um, we had to, we couldn't keep the websites live um, because there was so much demand. Um, so we actually had to, we had ended up buying a queuing system, which is what Barcelona Football Club used to stop their tickets from crashing when they get like the Champions League final or something. But literally what we had to do, employ and you'd get like a slot and you'd be on the waiting list. And yeah, we just worked. We had the rug pulled out from underneath us. I had a week of being thoroughly depressed and upset and crying a lot. And then we just went for it. And um, yeah, we we created a really big business really quick. And it was it was hard. You've got an amazing mindset. And what we were talking about is like, you know what you were talking about earlier about it's just as we just as you're on the precipice of burnout, that's when all your banging ideas come. <laughs> yeah. So I've got to come back out swinging. What are you saying to yourself when you're at home and you're looking in the mirror and like, every, you know, COVID's coming in and it's just shackling and um, ripping everything to shreds. What are you saying to yourself? Because people listening to this have got to build, even myself, like build a strong mindset yeah. to deal with adversity. What is, what are you saying to yourself? My, I think that period made me realize the responsibility of employing people more than ever before. I think, right. I think before then I was more thought about the food and being a chef and like enjoyed working with people and stuff. But I remember literally stood just there and everyone was sat around addressing people and tr about trying to say, you know, before we even knew like there was a furlough going to come in and stuff and just saying, look guys, I don't know what it is, but we'll make sure everyone's looked after. Don't worry. And I remember just crying my eye. I couldn't get through the speech I was trying to make to people mm -hmm. to rally them together. Um, I don't, I like to be in control. And I think the thing with COVID was it, it was out of our control. So you had to wrestle back control. And I remember saying, look, I'm going to set up this food box business. I remember saying, having a conversation with my dad and I was like, look, it's riskier to do nothing than to take a risk and do something. Yeah, sure. So let's do something. And and he's always the first one who wants to do something. So he's just like, well, do it then. Like, right, we'll do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and yeah, I, I, I think like, I mean, I thank people. I think at that point, anyone trying to be any way, shape, entrepreneurial and get people to work and stuff, I think we were, you know, had a very generous audience at that point. Like people just wanted to, I, you know, even if I think early dolls, our product probably wasn't as great as it certainly is today. You know, we'd, we were learning, but I think people were very generous mm -hmm. because they wanted to, they wanted to help as well and do their bit. Um, it's the effects of idleness though. I can't, um, we used to have, there used to be a paint. I don't know where it is. I quite like it in my house. We used to have a painting, which my dad must have bought off eBay or something, uh, that used to be in the restaurant upstairs before we had a bit of a redesign. And it, which had, it was like a Victorian family and they were all sat around in their like fine clothes looking thoroughly depressed. And it just said the effects of idleness. And it's so true. If you're idle, you just spiral. Like you've got to keep yourself busy, haven't you? That's bang. Yeah. You've got to keep yourself busy. And like, I knew there was no way I could personally sit still for two weeks, let alone whatever it ended up being, however many months. I needed to get my teeth into something. Um, and I wanted, I worried about people not, I know people had a great time and a lot of our guys had a great time being off work and it was beautiful sunshine and stuff like that. But for me, I can't handle that. And I think it's unhealthy for every, anybody to not be productive. So, um, you know, that was a big driving force for me. But the main thing was just that security thing. Um, I think when you're backed against a wall, like I didn't, we did not have financial security for ourselves at that point. And we definitely didn't have it for our employees. So we didn't have it across the board. And you saw people just make it redundant in some businesses that happened. That was a thing. Like I was employing people who'd be made redundant by other people because they wouldn't pay the, you know, cause furlough, all right, was great, but it, as an employee, employer, it cost you a lot of money as well. You were still paying all the national insurance, you're still paying the holidays, things like that. If you employed a lot of people, you still had a big wage bill every month on top of it. Um, so yeah, it was just this drive to try and look after people and make sure we were still here. Like I had no idea if this place would ever open again because I just didn't think we'd have the finances to do it. We were so hand to mouth. But so I was literally launching boxes on a Wednesday, 
we were collecting the money by Thursday morning and we were paying it out, back out to our debtors by Thursday afternoon. And then we, after weeks of doing that, suddenly we're like, hey, wait a minute, we're actually making money. We've paid everyone off. And then we just bring more and more people into work. And it just felt great. It felt like the right thing to do. Mm. It was one of the most fun times of my life. Yeah, but, but again, it's like, I think we, this, this ability to accept when we're our backs against the wall. And I think, I can't remember what exactly you said, but the effects of vileness equals spiralness. And I, I just think that is so, so it's a beautiful phrase, really. Yeah. And I think it's, it's just that just keep hammering. My sort of way of saying it is just, just keep fucking hammering and it will, it will come good. In terms of this, I want to we'll go, I want to go into two things from what you've said, but in terms of making this a destination, mm. You said 2008 was the hardest point. Yeah. We are in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And I think I read somewhere where you said you'd made a few, like the hardest bit was getting people to actually come here. Yeah. And it's not like you're in London or you're in Manchester mm. or you're in Leeds where you've got the footfall. Mm. What are the specific things you did? I know there's, there's, yeah. I know there's fucking pretty low, no. but like what are the one or two things that made people think, right, Blacks when old said, is a place I will come, to, I've, you know, five, six hours for me to get yeah. here and loved it. So I don't think, if I'm honest, we were very successful at it. I think, see, I think at that point you have to understand my naivety. I don't think I actually knew what a mission star was. Um, all we knew is I just wanted to make it better. Well, how are we going to make it better? And that was just what the mantra was just like, we got to make it better. Yeah. So it's just like, you was, again, it was detail obsessed. It was oh, well, if we um, we make sure we polish the glasses in this way, if we try, or a lot of it was food related. It was just trying to, you know, recreate, use reading recipe books and trying to make delicious food. Um, but we had these sort of what I'd almost call like wilderness years, which was 2009 right through 2011. We actually won a Michelin star. So we're almost like doing well. Um, and that was, we had a chef here, Adam, who was head chef and there's me, Adam and a couple of others. And then he moved on to his own thing and I took over like formally as head chef in 2013 and retained the star. So that's when I was like the youngest mission star chef in the country. But at that point, we were still opening the restaurant some nights for nobody. And that is mentally challenging because you're like giving it everything you've got and nobody comes to eat in your restaurant. So like we hadn't achieved what I'd set out to achieve. Um, the, and to be honest, we were, we were, we were unsuccessful and we were on the edge of calling it a day, really. I mean, I remember we had to like borrow money from like family members, stuff like that, to try and keep it afloat. Um, the precipice was, um, Great British Menu was what, what changed everything. Um, I'd filmed Great British Menu and obviously I did very well on it. And, um, from there, once it actually came out, we were just rammed. Really? People bought into our story and everything worked. So we needed that break and we needed that publicity. Um, so that was a big one. But before that, I remember ringing the producer every week because it got, they said it was going to come out in spring and it was like the Euros that year. And it came in like, 2016. Yeah, it didn't come out until September. And I remember at the time we were just, we just were, we were bankrupt. Premium. We had nothing. We were just holding out for this TV show and it went crazy. And, and that was it. But I knew, I remember being in my hotel room in London uh, when the studio was in London and I was sat there. And I knew the importance. This was like the final roll of the dice for me as a chef. I was like, I need to, I need to win this. I have to win this or we haven't, oh, it's my career. I'm doing a different career because I knew, I spoke to other chefs and found out how much, um, business you could bring in if you, if you did well, but I was also very, very keen to control the narrative. So I wanted people to realize I wasn't just any old chef. I wanted to realize I grew my own food and I did lots of creative things. So like I came down with like plant pots of things, which I picked to order. They had them on the side and really tried to control the narrative. I tried to make sure that all the filming we did was at my restaurant and not at, um, you know, go visit some supplier or something. I was very much trying to, clever. it was, really clever, yeah. well, trying to make the most of the situation and it just worked. It changed everything. I want to talk about Great British Menu because I think there's two, you mentioned your granddad, Fred, but I think one dish was in O. O yeah, yeah. And then you did the, the turbot with strawberries and cream, yes. which was that, which one was first? Uh, so my granddad's one was the first. Oh, uh, mate, so that's, so you, and that was even more personal, I suppose, because you're, so you're, uh, your back's up against the wall, you've had this bereavement, yeah. and it's like, fuck it, I'm coming out swinging. I, I, yeah. I love that. And so, that, like, how did you, what was the creative process for that dish? 
because you, it's all or nothing for you. You're in this. I'm trying to really get into your mindset. Yeah. It's like I have to make this work. There's no other option. Why did you win win it? Basically, I'm trying to get into that mindset. So I think anyone who wins it has put more work into the next person. Basically, I left no stone unturned in terms of I knew I needed to win that competition. So I may, I mean, I would go to a point where I take my own pillow. So I get like better sleep, like details, marginal gains. I had a backup of everything. I worked everything out to the degree, to the second, to the milligram. I had backup scales. I had backup probes so I could test the temperature of their water bath to make sure it was exactly the same as how I'd practice. I, I, there was not a single detail I did not address. And that's how winning is done. Like you get into a point where you've gone to such a level that I like to put myself in a position where I've gone to such a level that I know nobody else will have gone to that level and then I'll win. And that was my mindset and that's why I won both times I did it. Um, I think though that's obviously just in the execution in terms of the creative side, which is, you know, so important in a competition like that. I think I just tried to draw on things which were really personal to me. And, and if I'm honest at that point, I was, even though it was, quite a long time after my grandfather's death, I hadn't processed it and I was still grieving very much. Um, and I, I mean, still to this day, I do, uh, just desperate to make him proud. And I think that was, uh, an opportunity on the biggest stage, which I'd ever had in my life to sort of say thank you to him and to make him proud. So, um, I mean, I, I know a lot of chefs do, oh, this is my grandma's recipe, or this is this, and this is like, you know, it's a marketing tool for some people, but that was, that was raw for me. That was real. If I've watched you on YouTube, it's his voice is coming through the stage. Yeah. And I, I literally, it viscerally yeah. got me going. I was like, and that's, there was like almost emotion explosion. And like, we don't have to ask this. I try and push myself to ask potentially hard questions. Yeah. But if you were to like cook for him tonight, what would you cook Granddad Fred? And what would you sort of say to him now you've got all this wonderful success? Well, the funny thing is he, he wouldn't really necessarily understand it because um he we were a very humble sort of background and he wasn't into cooking and fine dining and he would think this was grossly overpriced <laughs> and why would why would anybody ever want to do yeah. this um i know what i'd cook from though because i remember growing up when we used to go around the house they always used to uh do like a sun my grandma would do like a sunday roast it always be lamb and they'd always have this sort of very uh, memories of um little baby Maris bar potatoes they grow in the garden, peas that were freshly potted, and then they had all this apple mint, which is like the furry mint. It's my favourite of the mint family. It was always growing. They'd always chuck handfuls of that in the pressure cooker and pressure cook the potatoes. I think I'd do him a nice just sort of roast lamb with some peas and potatoes and mint because I know he'd, he'd really like it. Um, but I'd be less about the food and more about the conversation, I think. I just want to talk to him. Mm, mm. No, that's so, so like powerful it's so good to sort of uh, why I'm doing this and what's why I like to do them for long is that you can really get into someone's draw yeah. and mentality and it you know I didn't realize doing the research how up against the wall you were mm. and I think there's something for everyone listening to this is when you are up against it you have that option of do you slow down or do you speed up I think that's that's uh, by that the Dyson guy going on I was just about the same the same thing it wasn't James Dyson pretty much bankrupt at 45 yeah he's got because I've I'm trying to potentially interview him, which is a long, my mate's, is not, nothing to do with food, but my mate's, his, um, his girl, missus is his sort of PR person. So I've been reading a lot about him recently, but he's got a quote, which is, I learned the moment you want to slow down is the moment you should accelerate. That's it. Mm. And it's like, I think there's a lot in that. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, 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 the turbot with the strawberries and the cream, yeah. I think I love creative process. I just think it's really mm. like an interesting Thing like, how did you? What is was the brief? So it was uh, to celebrate Wimbledon. Um, it was a hundred and I've got to get the number of years right, 125, 140 years, something like that. It was an anniversary of Wimbledon. Um, so the banquet was at the uh, at Wimbledon, and it was all about the championships and about uh tennis and summertime and that sort of nostalgic vibes and I think like the great thing about Wimbledon is it's on terrestrial TV um, for two weeks so I think people really buy into it it's a very visible thing isn't it I think people yeah. who are so I'm not a huge tennis fan but I always follow Wimbledon because like it's a thing right 
And, and I think the beautiful thing is it isn't behind a paywall where most sort of elite sport is nowadays. Um, so that was the, that's a tangent. Um, so that, that was the brief. Um, well, there was a couple of things actually, um, if I'm very honest, the season before when I'd won, I was sat having a drink at the rap party with Matthew Fort, who was a judge at the time. And he was like, all these bloody chefs doing, they always do a bit of water bath, bloody salmon or something. And all I want is a good roast piece of turbot. If someone did that, they'd definitely win. I just remember at the time, just writing roast turbot in my phone. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. Yeah. I, was like, I, mean, I said to him afterwards, he goes, I have no recollection of saying that. I was like, okay, fine. Um, and then I think, well, if I said to you, the briefs, Wimbledon, what would you do? You do strawberries and cream dessert, right? And, and to be honest, 90% of the chefs on the show did that. I just thought, I just don't want to do that. I don't want to be the same as everybody else. Plus everybody who watches that show every week, they're going to watch who's doing a different strawberries and cream dessert. And I just thought that's just boring. So I thought, let's do it as a fish course. So it was a roast roasted the turbot, took the bones, made a beautiful stock and made like a really classic cream based sauce. So it was white, like cream and, but creamy and delicious. And then I'd been working a while on different techniques with strawberries because something we find difficult to ripen sometimes. So I'd made these umeboshi strawberries, which is like umeboshi is a Japanese technique they do with uh, unripe plums and they're really sort of salty and savory. I almost have like an olivey sort of taste and texture. So I've been doing that with, um, heavily unripe strawberries and they, they really work well with fish dishes. So I was like, mm, so maybe I can do some like fresh strawberries, red ones and some unripe ones and some, uh, umeboshi ones. Uh, and then with this creamy sauce and, and I, I remember splitting it with a green oil, which was chives, which you see every chef do now. And that's like a thing, but that many years ago, it wasn't really a thing. And I think, uh, that was the thing. So you saw this dish and it was like basically a piece of fish that was covered in strawberries. You're like, wow, that's weird and then he poured this sauce on it was white but it was also bright green and it sort of swirled around and people were like wow and then you eat and it's very well balanced um so i think of it of, it, of its time it was pretty creative yeah yeah you know for sure and what are the chefs were on it at that time with you um i remember so the first year who was i up with i, I remember feeling quite insecure because i was the only one who wasn't from like a really named That's restaurant right, yeah. yeah so the first i mean there was so the other winners were mark Freudland and he was Head chef for Marcus Warren had Daniel Clifford's two head chefs, Simon Rogan's head chef, um, Josh Eggleston, a really good guy on Mission Star, and Phil Carmichael was Jason Afton's head chef, and Michael Bremner, who was a restaurant in Brighton. Um, so it was like everybody, other than say maybe me, Michael, and Josh, the other guys were all, the other five of them were all like basically the most famous chefs in the country. They were their head chef sort of thing. So they were all coming from a very different background to me, uh, but they're all mint guys. I really enjoyed yeah, yeah, really enjoyed it. Made some really great friends with it. So cool. And I, I want to. There's a few more things I just wanted to talk about. And it's what you talked about. As on, we were talking about this, what you practice in private makes public almost seem like magic. And yeah. you said the reason you won is that I was going to leave no stone unturned. Mm. And just that sort of that preparation. Is that I mean my math teacher used to have on the wall I used to think fucking hell but she was so right so fails to prepare prepare to fail yeah, I mean it, yeah. there's something in that so with with this is we we came on a Saturday and there's a few things I noticed that I'd love to kind of just explore with you so the first is like why are the chairs when you walk in like at that angle because it's I think with services these little um, and just the the magic are these little things that cost nothing mm. but can have a huge return on emotional yeah. investment it's welcoming. Yeah. That they're on an angle because if you close, it's just the same as body language. You'll never have been served by anybody with what we call closed body language. So at no point will a, a, a member of staff have had their back or even their side to you. You always, so you'd always serve uh, open with an open style of body language because it's, it's nice. I think as soon as you show someone your shoulder or your back, it's closed off and it doesn't feel as friendly. And it's the same. So we practice a lot and that is things that nobody notices unless they're some wild body language stuff at uh, studio, but that's so important. So yeah, we, um, you know, and we'll do it. We'll say, ah, oh, we'll, we'll really occasionally you make mistakes and you realize and you talk about, it, you go, ah, oh, yeah, we should have served them slightly more like that. Next time we go to the table, make sure we're like that. Cause it's friendlier. Um, 
the chairs being open and to die room is exactly that they're open like arms are open like it's welcoming you to that this is your table of the evening the the arms are open come on in sit down enjoy whereas i think if you got to pull the chairs out it's sort of like this is a table and you're going to sit there and it's all a bit clunky um I think they're little things, but they're psychologically, I think it, it really counts. It's another one I find I, I'm quite a um, big guy. So I find that when, when people want to talk to me at the table and I'm chatting for a while, after a while, I just crouch at the table because I just crouch on my, on my knees because actually it makes me so much more accessible and like less imposing. Whereas you stand over somebody, it's quite imposing. So I think it's a body language thing, which is important. Yeah, I mean, I love all this stuff because it's it's all these these little things that can have this huge emotional uh, difference, and it's, it's the creativity, really. Mm. So, what are the some of the other things that you do? And that could be like I don't know the music or the plates. It could be anything that that have like this huge emotional uplift. That actually, to be honest, guests. Obviously, I was being super vigilant because I knew I was interviewing you today. Yeah. But what are some of the other things you focus on? Oh, so we, well, I talk about plates. I mean, I've worked with potters uh, for years, specifically Jane, um, who, so dishes are developed. So I'm thinking like the first thing that you'd have had when you arrived was a little canapé, which was a uh, lobster and ruboshi in a little croustard, yeah, so which is actually in a millstone, which as you enter the village from either side, there's millstones that say Oldstead on them. And it's, it's the first thing when you, when you come into village, because you come along, you're like, are we here yet? Are we there? Where the hell is this place? And then you get there and there's a millstone that says Old said, Oh, Old said, Oh, it must be the right place. And that's why the first thing you get is a millstone. And so things like that, I think, are another, um, it's nuanced, but it's another sort of uh, welcome. I think it may, hopefully, like I feel like I've come home when I see the millstone. And I think, like, hopefully people feel at home. Um, I think one of the really cool collabs we've just done recently was with Block Knives. So when you had your main course, yeah such a good touch such a good touch that so block knives are amazing crafts craftsmen uh make the knives so we always serve like a, a meat knife with the main course and, and what we've done is set in the handle in resin um set different ingredients that we forage or, or have which is just another story point so they might have douglas fir needles in or hogweed seeds or marigold flowers or something something that'll be on your menu at some point but like the fun thing is you get to choose your weapon sort of thing so it's like they come over a box you're like which would you like and like oh i'll have the borage flower one and like you have you choose your own knife and i think that's sort of fun how you're so fun and so, so like, uh, again just so we obviously got the cost of the knives but such a little almost free thing to do it doesn't cost mm. you much money but has such an emotional uptick it's and more it, storytelling yeah and so who thought of that and like how do you know that was actually callum my head chef who had that idea um i'd had a similar idea when we first opened roots i really wanted to do a bar top and the whole bar top would have been resin and it would have had all these ingredients set in it i just never got around to doing it yeah I mean, they'd just have an oak bar top but like it would have been fun you know it's just ideas isn't it and also it wasn't a very practical bar top was the resin but anyway it's a cool idea um, and it became the knives so I, I don't know if Callum had because when Callum mentioned it to me I was like oh I had that idea years ago bar top. I don't know if he'd known that or we just both had the same idea I don't know and no no completely and I, also I think in terms of um, music as well yeah I think you, the tunes you were playing were, was all very dad rock Dad, well, yeah, no, it was great. It was like, I want to listen to the Beatles and I want yeah. to listen to Jimi Hendrix and I want to listen to, I went to Cornerstone and do you know Cornerstone in Hackney yeah. last week? Yeah. And they were playing just the Smiths. Yeah. And I, I think the music, because it's not stuffy at all. And it like, so what's, where does that come into it and why is that? So it's a funny one because um, my brother does a lot of that. And I think when you listen to, when you work in the restaurant, you actually get sick of the, the playlist. But I think, I think it's, um, so we always say you want to work with like-minded individuals. Um, so like when we did Banks Brothers Wine, that's all about like-minded. Everybody we work with, and it goes back to the thing I said at the start, which is don't do business with people you don't like. And definitely on the music thing, I just don't like it. I want creative, dynamic people. If it's, you know, Jimi Hendrix or it's Bob Dylan or whoever, if it's the Beatles or whatever. What I love about um, sort of 60s and 70s music especially and then into the 80s and stuff. a lot of it is very original because like they literally were pioneers a lot of them and i think that's where it lends itself better to the food than than some more modern music really yeah it's just what i'm love learning i always learn like one key principle i think it's with with you tommy is this 
like almost fastidious attention to detail, even with the music, thinking about the, <clears throat> both for the, for the people eating the restaurant, myself on Saturday, but also the people in the kitchen. Um, just kind of times, there's just a few more questions yeah. I really want to wrap up with, mate. Um, so I've interviewed, uh, so I interviewed Paul Avery for what we were talking about, and, yes. and he had one principle, and I actually interviewed Greg, um, Marshall, he's got Frenchie in Covent Garden. Yeah. And I'd love, I like boiling down everyone. I think everyone's got their own principle in life. It's just one sentence that sticks with them and it it it, it draws people to you and pushes away the wrong people as we've been talking about. Mm. Paul's was, and he's got it on his kitchen, we talked about this a lot, is make it happen, make it happen together. Mm. Which he's got in his number yeah. six in Padstow. Greg Marchant was whatever you want. What would you say your sort of one sentence is or one principle yeah do you know and this goes back to when when i was a, a young head chef and probably everybody i employed was older than me i usually think like how how do i like get everyone to do what i want them to do and how do we have this sort of discipline i never wanted to i had a few bad experiences where i'd done like bits of stages and being bullied or like being trapped very badly sorry, sorry, we, we... stages is like um so in our industry we'll have you can go and work for free in someone's kitchen, like work experience. Right. Um, like, an, like you call it an internship or something, uh, yeah. but it's yeah. less formal than that. You just literally say, can I come for a day? And they go, yeah. Um, and, and I'd been very inspired not to be that sort of tyrant. Um, so I decided, how would I get, what I want people to be is be disciplined in their work. But how do you achieve discipline? It's not by, through discipline. Actually, people need to have self-discipline. So I was like, how do I achieve self-discipline? I think that's by inspiring people. Um, so my thing was always uh, discipline through inspiration. So create an inspiring environment and people will have the self-discipline to deliver because they want to be part of it because they're inspired. So I think rather than uh, being a tyrant or shouting or screaming or being horrible to work for, but like that's how you just rule through fear, create an inspirational environment where people want to be a part of it and because they're so in, bought into the environment, they'll have the self-discipline to complete the tasks because they've inspired. So it's so yeah, discipline through inspiration. Discipline through inspiration, and they're almost kind of two two opposing things, almost because you think yeah. dis, you think of discipline as da 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 da, yeah, and inspiration as this kind of ethereal thing that comes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think I've I seriously believe in this. Is is back to this war of art? Is the the two are like inextricably mm. intertwined. Like this thousand gazillion percent on that. And how do you, you know, you've got two restaurants now, got made an old city, we've got the Banks Brothers Wine. Like, how do, how do you actually do that? How do you, and we can talk about what the vision is for the next three years, and how do you bring, get people to become disciplined? Because I think that is ultimately what everyone listening to this is trying to do with their team. Yeah. Um, it's a good question. So I think... I mean, I'm just a pain because I keep, keep thinking of ideas and I've got quite a lot more and then they make them other people's problem, really. And um, so now I think the, the key thing is giving ownership to people. So I often hear chefs, especially, can be very precious and they'll say, you know, you work for me, it's my way of the highway sort of thing. Whereas I, I look at everything as a joint venture. So I like to empower people and give them ownership. And that's the only way we've been able to expand and to do different things. We're in a pub in a couple of weeks' time. You know, like you say about Banks Brothers and a lot of the other sort of contracts we now do have made in Ulster take up a lot of time. And people say, oh, the art of delegation, you've got to delegate things. But I don't think it's just delegation. It's actually giving ownership. Um, if you give ownership of things to people and make them in charge, and, and that, but that is a joint venture. So when I say give ownership, I don't just say you are doing this and then report to me and then I'll tell you if it's right or wrong. Mm. Like, I like to see other people's personalities. So if it's a Callum, the head chef here, like he has full ownership of that. I'm not meddling and interfering, I'm supporting. So like every dish that goes on the menu, like we cook it up, we talk about it, we go through it, we work together. We say, oh, I'd quite like to do this. Or I'd quite like to do that. But he has ownership of it. At no point am I putting a um, stick in his spokes or am I um, telling him what he can and can't do. We just, it's collaborative and he has respect for me. I have respect for him. Mm. And, and that is the same across the board in the business. Um, and I think that's been the secret to success and so, to secret to retaining 
um, our staff retention, but also the secret to being able to expand in, into different areas is because they have the overall vision. I want to go and do this, we do that. And, and actually this is your baby now and, and hand it over, over to people. It's almost like you've got the inspiration here, the discipline here, which you need to achieve the inspiration. And it's like that circle. Yeah. But then you've got in the middle is this ownership piece that bridges the two together. Cause that's what I was trying to get is how do yeah. you bridge the two together? Yeah. And then also what we were talking right about at the beginning is the way all of that ownership works in the right way is empathy. Yeah, exactly. So, and, and when you've got all these, so you think about it, we've got a food box business, an outside catering business, a canned wine business, and soon to be three. Where is the pub, by the way? The, the pub is a mile down the road, which is uh, Byland Abbey, which is a mile from here, which is where both me and my bro started. So I was a pot washer there when I was 14. Uh, uh, so that's yeah. why it's like whole whole circle. Um, and everybody needs to get on and everyone needs to work towards the same thing. Um, but we are a people business it doesn't work without people so the single i think the biggest responsibility i have day to day is making sure that we're a good place to work and that people want to be here and they know where we're going and they want to be a part of it and if i achieve that then everyone else takes their ownership they've got the self-discipline and we nail it mm. wicked and then i just suppose the final final question is is what what is the the vision for for in the next five years, like where do you want to go and what do you want it? If you were to, you know, sit here in five years time, what would your success look like? Yeah, so we've got quite a lot of different irons in the fire. Uh, obviously, uh, we're this pub, which would be really fun. Um, I, this is going to be quite a long answer to a question. Yeah, no, if you want to wrap it, wrap yeah, yeah, it off really. Um, I think in, in terms of like the restaurants themselves, we will reinvent them in the next few years which could be really interesting i think that's you know fashions and times change um will never change from the ethos but i think uh i think we will reinvent the restaurants in quite a cool way i'm certainly not at a stage in my career where i'm like, oh, i've uh, achieved what i can achieve sort of in terms of in terms of our restaurants i want to uh reinvent them i've got some very very cool ideas which i have to keep a little bit close to my chest which will are quite out there um, but I, I especially think for the Black Swan, I would like it in the future to become a um, more of a, a theatre than anything else. Uh, um, and then in terms of, we're still quite early on our regenerative farming um, uh, journey. Um, I think there's a lot more we, we want to do in terms of getting, getting the, and spreading the word and sort of supporting the farming industry, which I'm really passionate about. Um, We've been growing a lot in terms of the, um, the, the corporate catering world and trying to, uh, do, you know, working with Wimbledon, Twickenham, Lords, Silverstone this year. So like all the big ones, uh, and you know, I'm really trying to work, apply these sort of disciplines that we have here into that world. Cause I feel like there is a real niche there. Um, you know, I think so often, um, hospitality catering in, is very expensive in sort of sports ground, stuff like that, and often very bad. Um, so we are really trying to become a niche, um, a niche company in, in that market. Uh, but the biggest thing for me, is, the thing that I care about most is, is people. And, and I think, you know, I talk about that a lot, but there's several things. The thing that I'd be most excited about and want to see is the development of people over the next five years, the development of our jobs and our company over the next five years. I'm very passionate about creating highly paid, really good hospitality jobs that are career worthy. So what I'm 34 this year. So people who are my age in the company, who've been in the company five, six years will be nearly 40 in five years time. They need good jobs that are well paid, that are going to support their families and are going to give them the work-life balance, which is appropriate. So building that is what I really care about. Uh, and lastly, um, I want more, more women, especially in the kitchen and in the higher positions. We're doing apprenticeship scheme nowadays where we take on six apprentices a year. I think from a HR perspective, I'm not allowed to say I want at least half of them to be women, but I do. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 <laughs> I think yeah. I did a qualification there. Um, and I, cause I, I genuinely believe that we need, we need to get, um, we need to find, um, girls when they're younger and make them feel like it's a great place to come and work because the future of the hospitality industry really relies on, on women. I think in order to break down some of the boundaries and stereotypes of the industry, you need to create a diverse workforce. And I think any leadership group or any workforce really is better when there's both men and women in that environment and people from different backgrounds. And I, and I think that um, that's what I want to really achieve is um, more diversity. Mm. Mate, I've, I've 
thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed that. Thank you so much. No, it's been fun. I enjoyed um, it, yeah. Is, uh, I think with it, with every pop episode, I always get like one salient piece that really sort of sticks to me. I think with you, it's this whole discipline, this discipline for yourself, discipline for mm. the team, discipline and inspiration. I don't know if you've heard of the guy Jocko Willink. Have you heard of that? Oh, it's this SAS army dude. That's probably the worst. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he's got a quote which I love, which is discipline equals freedom. So actually the more mm. discipline you do, the more... Probably, is. probably quite literally, though, in, in his case. I think the big difference between my discipline and the army discipline, though, is I'm talking about self-discipline. I'm talking about all being disciplined in your work because you're trying to achieve something. Whereas I think army discipline is the opposite of what I want, which is actual discipline, like telling people how to how they have to behave. Mm. I think it's got to come from yourself. Mm. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, man.